You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. A global rise in the cases of COVID-19, the pandemic caused due to deadly SARS-CoV-2 virus has hit almost every country on the planet. The South Asian region, which was comparatively less affected until last week, has also witnessed a spike in the number of people contracted with the virus. However, the governments have been prompt in their reaction and have taken major decisions to preempt the virus. While India has invoked its Epidemic Act to suspend all visas of foreign nationals, other South Asian countries too have ramped up their efforts at containing the virus. Streets are deserted, stock markets have no stived, international trade has come to a halt and a massive wave of panic has erupted across the world as deadly coronavirus is spreading rapidly. The World Health Organization declared it a pandemic after it killed more than 4,000 people worldwide and affected more than 125,000. The South Asian countries, the neighbors of China, which were less hit by the virus as compared to Europe and America until previous week, are also seeing a rise in the number of patients. However, the governments have been prompt as they have taken a host of measures to contain the epidemic in their states. India has suspended the visas of all countries until next month. Schools, colleges and theatres have been closed to avoid any mass gathering. It has also ramped up the screening of travellers to keep the virus at bay. It has also closed border with one of its neighbours in the line of its precautionary measures against the virus. People have also been asked to stay away from the game of cricket, which has got a massive fan following in the country. Although citizens are disappointed, but they have supported the decision of the government. <laughs> बहुत पहले हमको खुशी थी मैच देखने के लिए पहली बार मैच देखने के लिए आए थे लखनऊ में दूसरी बार मैच हो रहा है यहां पे निराशा तो जरूर हुई लेकिन जो है ये जो फैसला हुआ है एक प्रकार से देखा जाए तो आम जनता के लिए सबके लिए हम सब के लिए बहुत अच्छा फैसला हुआ श्रीलंका टू क्लोज्ड ऑल स्कूल्स एज सून एज द फर्स्ट केस ऑफ द वायरस वाज रिपोर्टेड इन द कंट्री the government, however, has confirmed that there is no health emergency in the country and institutes were closed to prevent panic spreading around. Similar steps have been taken in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan and Maldives where governments have advised people to stay away from public gatherings and events. While various commentators have expressed their apprehension at South Asia's competence at controlling the spread of virus, it has thus far been the least affected despite its close proximity with China, the home to the outbreak of the disease. Other countries, on the other hand, have suffered massively and thousands have died so far, with most cases being reported from Iran and Italy. The countries have taken sweeping measures to contain the virus. The World Health Organization has said that it is a controllable pandemic.
It has asked countries to strike a fine balance between protecting health, preventing economic and social disruption and respecting human rights. It has urged all countries to take a comprehensive approach tailored to their circumstances with containment as the central pillar. Moving on to what on Afghanistan where a prevailing two-pronged crisis is now deepening. While the Ghani establishment and the Taliban have still not found a mutually agreed cause to go ahead with the peace process, two presidential inaugurations with other held by self-proclaimed president of the country, Abdullah Abdullah, have created a situation of impasse. International community, including the United States, has so far refrained from stepping in. The political situation has seemingly plunged into a chaos in war on Afghanistan as both Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah have sworn in for the presidential post. Separated only by a wall, they both held their inaugurations in capital Kabul. President Ashraf Ghani, who is seeking international recognition as per experts, said that he was willing to work with all sides and peace was just a matter of time in the country. While Ghani's ceremony comes in the line of country's election commission's decision, which declared him the winner, Abdullah's proclamation has been based on defiance. He has repeatedly accused the election process as fraud and has called himself the real winner of the contest. He said that he will not concede to any international, domestic, and political pressure like he did in 2014. مردم افغانستان برنده واقعی انتخابات هستند. اگر در سال 2014 به هدف ثبات و وحدت ملی تن به مصلحت نمیدادیم، کشور به بحران می رفت. اما اکنون موضوع کاملا برعکس است. اگر این بار تحت هر نام نتیجه تقلب را می پذیرفتیم فاتحه دموکراسی در افغانستان باید خوانده می شود. And this face off has further complicated the course of the peace process as nobody knows who will lead the talks from the Kabul side. Although nobody could decode the statement, the former chief executive of the country said that he was committed to make sacrifices if needed. Keeping in view his vigorous anti ghani campaign, nobody, however, has said that he was talking about giving up presidential ambitions. <laughs> ایجاد اجماع سیاسی و تعیین هیئت مذاکره کننده می باشد. سولیتا در سیدول پارا دالتیا پر محال قربانی ور کولوتا جمنیوم. Meanwhile, Ashraf Ghani has laid out the plan of prisoner swapping. While he has agreed to release all 5000 Taliban insurgents, the process is bound by certain conditions. While first 1,500 will be released in batches of 100 per day, remaining 3,500 will have to wait for the inter-Afghan dialogues to begin. They will be later released in batches of 500 per week if everything goes as per the plan. Ghani has also asked them to sign an undertaking they will never pick arms against the state forces in future. Taliban is not satisfied with the proposal and is asking for its terms and conditions to be satisfied first. It has even specified the names of the prisoners it wants to be released. 
The release of the prisoners is a part of a deal signed by the United States and the Taliban last month that would allow US forces and NATO troops to withdraw from Afghanistan to end more than 18 years of war. It requires all released Taliban prisoners to provide, quote, a written guarantee not to return to the battlefield. In exchange, the Taliban has agreed to hand over a thousand Afghan troops. Years of war and a conservative outlook in Afghanistan hasn't been able to dampen the spirit of women in the country. They have not only presented themselves as equals, but have taken up professions that are considered challenging to men as well. Whether it is about running a media house or organizing a fashion show, they have shown their worth to the world. And the counting doesn't stop here. There are numerous stories of Afghan women's grit and passion. Today we have brought a story from capital Kabul where a women-led team is running food trucks. Unaware of the growing complexities in Afghanistan's political arena, 30-year-old Maryam Mohammadi is running a mobile food cart selling food and dairy to people on streets in capital Kabul. She hopes that impending future where Taliban might become a part of the mainstream doesn't bring back the old days for women. When Taliban gained control of the country in 1996, they banned women from education and work and only let them leave their homes in the company of a male relative. They also banned music and movies and kept them away from any kind of Western influence. Women were also disenfranchised. Almost after two decades, women have only started to come out. They want to earn for their family. Mariam, who joined Panu's kitchen two months ago, is the breadwinner for her family. She was in Pakistan as a refugee for many years to escape the conflicts and war in Afghanistan. Twenty-seven-year-old Farhad Vajdi founded the Banu's Kitchen Rickshaw's business to destigmatize the status of women in Afghanistan. She wants women like her to become self-reliant and enjoy free will in a conservative society like Afghanistan, where working women are barely a sight to see. Farhad Wajdi aims to expand her rickshaw kitchen business all over the country to provide job opportunities for more women. However, it is only possible if the atmosphere is conducive for women. Taliban have recently been projecting themselves as more moderate as they have been observed saying Islam gives women rights in areas such as business and ownership. The peace deal that was signed between the Taliban and the United States has suffered initial hiccups with insurgents not conceding anything to the Ghani establishment. Intensifying rivalry between Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah has created further roadblocks for elusive peace that Afghans have been waiting for years.
Moving on. Pakistan's exploitation and cruelty in the illegally occupied regions of POK and Gilgit Baltistan is well known. While it has plundered almost all resources of the regions, poverty and terrorism have been its return gift to the people of these places. And the situation is only worsening with time. Recently, a group of activists condemned it on the sidelines of United Nations 43rd session of Human Rights Council. They also called out Pakistan's propaganda on Indian decision of amending an article of their constitution. A number of activists from around the world who gathered on the sidelines of 43rd session of UN Human Rights Council have condemned Pakistan for interfering in the internal matters of its western neighbour, India. They have also appreciated the amendment New Delhi brought in the Article 370 of its constitution to withdraw the special status of Kashmir in order to treat it at par with other parts of the country. An event held under the banner Jammu and Kashmir, shifting facts from fiction at Geneva Press Club comprehensively busted propaganda being paddled by Islamabad and some international media houses. It also uncovered the ugly truths about POK and Gilgit Baltistan that Pakistan has been brazenly concealing from the international community. The stories of deteriorating human rights situation and massive economic depredations. The unanimous opinion of experts supported the Indian move of last year. They believe that New Delhi amended the article in the interests of country's sovereignty. This move, this abrogation of 370, will eventually lead to the people in occupied Kashmir demanding more and more for their rights and for them to be seen equally and for them to be reintegrated with the rest of the Indian community. And hopefully, the rest of the world now will start to look more closely and scrutinize what is going on in Pakistani-occupied Kashmir and that they will then start to apply pressure to the Pakistani government and say, enough is enough, this has to stop. If these, if these terrorist groups are illegal in Pakistan, why are you allowing them? Pakistan, which has been running pillar to post to save its rapidly deteriorating image, was exposed at this conference too. Experts said that Islamabad was working overtime in preparing a radicalized force against India and it was providing safe heavens to the deadliest of terrorists under the sun. They said that Pakistan has used the land of POK and Gilgit Baltistan to set up launch pads for terrorists. What Pakistan has been doing in Gilgit Baltistan in Mirpur and Muzaffarabad and other occupied areas and how it has been able to uh, use Islam, and religion and terrorism as a tool to create mayhem in, in the entire region and cause bloodbath that has slowed down the economic development but at the same time have deprived us of an amicable solution that we deserve. Illegally occupied POK and Gilgit Baltistan have been the victims of terror factory being run by Islamabad. The people here are constantly under threat. And while it has been unleashing mayhem in these two territories, it has read out an altogether different script before the world, saying the welfare of these regions has been its priority. Activists exposed it. Promoting terrorism from uh, Pakistani occupied Jammu and Kashmir and then uh, infil infiltration into uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, this is a well-known fact and Pakistan has been, uh, uh, that, that, has, uh, that has been basically a nursery, a hatchery of uh, terrorism, uh, our part of Jammu and Kashmir. People belonging to this region have time and again expressed their plights and challenges on the top international platform, but they have not been accorded the attention they deserve. Neither the United Nations has released any statement condemning Pakistan's state-sponsored violence and loot in the region, 
nor has any other country come forward to support these people. And it is only after Indian decision that international community has called Pakistan an intruder and aggressor. But this seems just not enough for the people whose entire life has been destroyed by this occupier state. India celebrates a number of cultural and traditional festivals throughout the year. One such festival is Hola Mohalla, which is celebrated with great fervor and splendor. Hola Mohalla is an annual Sikh festival celebrated extensively over three days at Anandpur Sahib in India's northern state of Punjab. On this occasion, devotees camp out and enjoy various displays of fighting prowess and bravery and listen to Kirtan and music. South Asia Focus today takes a look at this unique festival. Thousands of Sikh devotees gathered at Sri Anandpur Sahib in Punjab's Ropar district to celebrate the annual spring festival of Hola Mohalla. The festival commemorates the transformation of the Sikh community into a martial fraternity by Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Guru of the Sikhs. The purpose of the festival was to physically strengthen the Sikh community by holding military exercises and mock battles. Hola Mohalla coincides with Holi, the festival of colours. Devotees also offered prayers at the holiest shrine of Sikhism, the Golden Temple, in the evening to mark the occasion. We came over here to get the blessings of the Almighty. Uh, we did have a dip in the holy water and uh, some people celebrate Hola Malla by going to Anandpur Sahib. They, they perform in various stuff like, like Gatka and stuff. But we just came here to get the blessings of the Almighty. That's how we, uh, as a family, we celebrate this festival. The word Mohalla is derived from the Arabic root Hal, a lighting descending and is a Punjabi word that implies an organized procession in the form of an army column. During this festival, the Sikh community display their physical strength by performing daredevil acts like bareback horse riding, standing erect on two speeding horses, gatka, mock encounters, tent pegging, etc. There are also a number of darbars where the Sri Guru Granth Sahib is present and Kirtan and religious lectures take place. On the last day, a long procession led by Panj Pyaras starts from Takhat Keshgar Sahib, one of the five Sikh religious seats and passes through various important Gurdwaras like Kila Anandgar, Logar Sahib. This is followed by music and poetry competition to lighten the charged up atmosphere. हम तो हमेशा ही आते हैं यहाँ पे तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है हमें हर मंदिर सब में आने के तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है वैसे भी ऐसा लगता है जैसे बाबा ही खुद आके होला मले की खुशी में जैसे फूल वर्ष आ रहे हैं हम हमें भी बहुत अच्छा लगता है कि भी हम रंगों के इलावा फूलों के साथ होली खेल रहे हैं। the annual festival has not only succeeded in preserving the Sikh tradition, but has been attracting tourists from across the world. The first Hola Mohalla was celebrated in 1670, a year after the birth of the Khalsa Panth. It is an occasion for the Sikhs to reaffirm their commitment to Khalsa Panth. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.